And goodness, what a good day it's been. I'm so thankful that we get to come back here tonight and we get to dig back into God's Word. And we're going to be still working on our seamless series tonight. And we're going to be looking tonight at Abram and Lot. There's a lot of different ways that we could, we could go into these verses and these passages, these chapters. But I think that the, the way that the Lord is leading me is I, wanna, I really want to dig into, into the two different facets of, of this family. We have two distinctions between Abraham and Lot, and they go two completely different directions. And so um, as we continue to work on it, I think that we can truly find Jesus in the details when we look at Abram. Now, most of us, we know him as Abraham, and that'll be a name that I, we'll see a name change as we work through these chapters tonight. I told the sound booth up there, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to conclude in chapter 19 tonight. I don't want you to think when I tell you that, that I'm going to preach eight chapters of the Bible, though. And so we're not going to go through every word and every verse, but we're going to just pick apart just a few different things, because there's a lot that happens in here, and I don't think that we could truly get the picture that we need to see if we uh, went through the whole thing. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to be in here seven or eight hours, unless y'all, unless y'all feel differently, we can do that, I don't mind. But, um, so we're going to look at the contrast, though, between Abram and Lot. And um, one man, we're going to see that someone represents our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to see the other one that truly represents man as himself. And, and in that, there's very clear distinctions. And so that my prayer tonight, and what I've, as I've been working through this, my prayer for everyone is that we can truly identify with one or the other. Now, it doesn't mean that, that we can't identify with the other one when we're done, but we should be able to identify with either the man of God or the man that needs God. That's where we all land. So as we do that, let's dive into the Scripture. And so what I'm going to do, since we're going to have so much Scripture now, I'm just going to pray, and then we're going to work through it and see where God leads us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here. Lord, thank you for, for this passage, these chapters, these verses. And God, I pray right now that you just impress upon our heart the things that we need to see. Lord, there's so much information, and there's so many different directions we could go. But Lord, you've placed a very distinct one on my heart. So Father, I pray that it is clear to us tonight that you want to move through us and that you want us to identify with a man that was after your heart. And so, Father, I pray that we leave here that way. I pray that we're pursuing you in all faithfulness. And so, Lord, thank you for everything that you're going to do. Thank you for Jesus. If it wasn't for him, this message would mean absolutely nothing. Lord, we would have no purpose, no reason, but we have it all because of him. So, Father, draw us near tonight. Let your spirit touch every heart. And, Father, I pray that we leave here with clear direction from you. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, so I told you we're going to start off in chapter 12. And I mean, I could give you a really great introduction and talk about all kinds of things, but let's just truly dive into it. Um, and so as we work through it, find Genesis chapter 12. And like I said, we're going to be uh, thumbing through these pages. But the first thing I want to look at is Abram, God's man of promise. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so as I was looking through this, one thing that I really didn't intend on talking about much, but it's just distinctly on my heart right now, it's first get out of your country from, from your family, from your father's house. Get away from there. God had something in store for him greater than he could have ever imagined. I think that we probably need to take that to heart. When we're going to look at Abram's faithfulness, it started right here with his willingness to step out of what he knew and what he had always trusted in. He was raised in a pagan generation. They did not hang, on, hang their hat on the Lord in any way, shape, or form. They lived by the feelings and by the... They were, just, they were as far away from God as they could possibly be. But God spoke to him and he responded. Have you had that moment? If God were to speak to you, would you respond? Could you do it in faith? I think we neglect to pay, that, pay attention to that. Abram started somewhere, and it was right here when he responded to God in faith. But specifically, I want us to look at the fact that he said, I will make you a great nation. God had a very specific purpose for Abram. It wasn't for him just to get out of that house, to get out of his father's land. It was because he wanted to send him somewhere, and he wanted to do great things through him. He was chosen to lead an entire nation, and that nation was God's people. Next, it says, I will bless you and make your name great. The Lord has made his name great. But why did God do that? Why did, why did he choose Abram? Why did he make Abram's name great? Well, so God could be glorified. And see, what he gave Abram, he wants to give every single one of us so that we can all glorify him. 
There's purpose in everything that God's doing. The difference in some people and others is some people are on board with him and some are not. Abram accepted God's challenge and stepped out on faith. And so, and you shall be a blessing. When we live within the Lord's will, we are going to be a blessing to others. Don't ever forget that. We are going to be a blessing to others. We're to be used to reach others and to bring God glory. And by doing that, we end up blessing other folks. And then it says, In all, and you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram was such a blessing to others that God made him a promise that reached all the way to where we're standing right here today. That promise was Jesus. The seed that came to save us all came right from Abram. You know, when we, when we come into worship, it had to start somewhere. Now, God, God had a divine purpose through it all, but he chose Abram to be where the seed started. And so we need to think about that. We probably, if he was faithful enough that he's where it started, we probably need to look at his life and see where we can draw comparisons and where we can make improvements in our life to be more like him. And so the next three verses and the passage paint a picture of, of Abram's real character. So I'm just going to read through a few of them. Like I said, we're going, to, we're going to move through a lot of scripture. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And there he built an altar to the Lord. In Genesis 12, 8, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. In Genesis 13, 3 through 4, And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Abram was a man that relied on the Lord. We see that continuously, time after time after time after time, no matter how great his faith was, he called on the name of the Lord. He went and worshipped him. He went and praised him. And he went and spent time with him. He wanted direction from God. That speaks directly to his character. And so what is your, where is your character? You know, I, this morning, I, if you made it to Sunday school, the lesson this morning was on God's character and how he'll never ask us to do anything outside of it. And so when we think about God's character, we can have confidence. If we know his word, we can have confidence in the things that we do based on what his character is. And we can also have no confidence in the things we do because we know they fall outside of what would be his will or anything that he would call us to do. Abram's character was one that he was drawing near to God so that when he stepped out, he knew that he was doing the things that God desired. Are you, an, are you identified by his character or your own? You know, as, I, as I'm telling you these things, how are, what, are, what inferences are we drawing about Abram's character? His character was a man that was pursuing God. What's yours? That'll tell you. You can look at what you do in life, what's important to you, all of the valuable things that you have. That'll identify your true character. If you pursue the things of this world, that's your character. If you desire the things of this world, that's your character. And it's okay. I'm not, I'm not chastising you. I did it for many, many, many years. I still catch myself doing those things sometimes. But you know what? I spend the majority of my life pursuing the things of God. And that's because of what he's done in my life. Who do you identify your character with? And so I'm setting this foundation for Abram. And I told you we're going to be talking about Lot. So let's look at just a little bit of a contrast as we step a little further into this scripture. And we're going to be still in Genesis 13. We're going to see a really big contrast. We're going to go from God's man of promise, which is Abram, and now we're going to see the fallen man, and that's going to be Lot. In Genesis chapter 13, in verses 5 through 7, Lot also, it says, Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. He was extremely blessed. He was riding along with Abram, and I'm going to tell you, he had just as much opportunity as him. He was blessed. Now, the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. How about that? They were so blessed that they couldn't continue to reside in the same area. God's hand was in their lives. That's a good place to be. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So the scene was set for Lot. But he had been given everything. He was just as much a child of promise as Abram was. You know, we can walk with people and we can live that life. But what happens if God separates us? He blessed them so much they needed to go different directions. We see it in the New Testament. It happens with, uh, with Paul and Barnabas. They ended up needing to go different directions. And it wasn't because they weren't in God's will. It's because they needed to go different directions. God sent them different places. Right here we see that Abram and Lot have been, been given the same exact blessing but now they need to part ways. So the thing was set for him to make choices and to be just as faithful as Abram was. But as we dig a little bit further, we're going to see that that didn't necessarily work out that way. 
Lot was given the opportunity that he could choose when they needed to separate. He could choose any direction that he wanted to go. He could look to the left. He could look to the right. He could look forward and look backwards. And he could go in any direction that he wanted. And so if we look in verses 10 through 13, we find out that he has cast his eyes. And let's see what happens. And it says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan, that it was all well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent as far as Sodom. But the men of, so of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And so we can see Lot's heart here. We can see the revelation of his heart. We can see that he was extremely selfish. He had the choice of going anywhere in the world and got first pick, and he definitely did what we always do with our first pick. We take the absolute best. Who, who wants to get second rate when they get the first pick? We never do. And you can put your hand down, son. Thank you. It's one of mine, of course, up on the top row. No big deal. But we, we never choose the second best. We always take the absolute best. We're selfish beings. That's man. That's what we do. We want the absolute best. You know, if there's two wonderful-looking steaks up there, but one ain't marbled as near, nearly as well as the other, unless you're my wife, you're going to pick the one with the most fat. That's where the flavor is. She's afraid that she might get fat from it, though. Ah, oh, man, I'm going to pack on the pounds for a good steak. We always want what's best. But here's, here's the thing. Lot was taken by the glamour and the beauty of what was in front of him. The lights that got us. Crystal told me long ago, before I was saved, so let me qualify that, that we heard a message about about this and, and the preacher talked about how, how Lot was looking out there and it was like looking at Las Vegas. You had the big city, you had the big lights, the neon style, all the things that draw. I don't remember not one word of that. Again, maybe I, I was lost. So I may, either she's making it up or I just wasn't paying attention. But either way, he saw this really awesome place and it drew him. He wanted the best of the best. He wanted the finest of the finest. He looked out there and it all looked really, really, really good. We've all been there. You know, we make decisions with our eyes all the time. Even, even in relationships, we make decisions with our eyes. We look at people and we make a decision on whether we want to be friends with them or not. We don't know their heart. We're just looking at them. Our eyes make all the decisions. And so, so he was taken by the lights and the glamour. It was like a river city that had everything. It was well watered, the Bible tells us. It was an awesome place to be. And, you know, if you're not really familiar, the land of Canaan had water up until until they ruined everything. But, but it was an arid area still. There was places that were very dry, so when it's well watered, it would have been somewhere you want to go, and they had a ton of livestock. If you're going to have livestock, you better have water. They weren't making any man-made pools back then. They needed water. They needed standing water so they would have it. Water was everything. The land was like the garden of the Lord. So Lot trusted his eyes, and how often are we guilty of the same exact thing? We go with what we see and not where the Spirit leads us. You know what happened, though? Abram, Abram was able to just trust in God and able to just receive exactly what he needed. Lot wanted to go take what he wanted, and Abram received what he needed. Again, we're going to see a, a stark contrast before, between them. So, and again, we find Abram being exactly who God called and created him to be. In verses 14 through 17, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, After Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the uh, from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. While Lot could, while Lot could only see the things that were evident to the eye, those in the Lord can see so much more. Let me say that again. While Lot could only see what was evident to the eye, Lot, uh, excuse me, those that are in the Lord can see so much more. Why is that? Be because our eyes can only see so far. But let me tell you this, I'm so thankful for it because God could see so much more in me and he could see so much more in you and he could see so much more in everyone than we could ever imagine. How many people have we wanted to quit on and just say that they're no good, they're no use, there's nothing we can do with them? Because all we can see is from the outside. God sees the heart. He knows what potential is in there because he created you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. Abram and Lot had the same opportunities here. Abram could have chosen and said, God, I'm going to trust you. Send me where you want me. But instead he said, I want that. 
Don't make those same choices. Don't be guilty of it. We do. But better than that, don't trust your eyes. We've already seen, we've already seen over and over that Abram was willing to go to the Lord and go to the altar and talk to him and hear from him and worship him. And Lot was just wanting to go. Which one's going to work out better? I don't think that this story is any surprise. I don't think there's any surprises. Most of us, if you've read Genesis before, you know the story, story forward and backward. We know what the ending is. Let's trust in the Lord. Let's go to him and let's worship him and let's look at what Abram did. And so look at God's promises coming to fruition. The promised land was revealed. He, he revealed the promised land to Abram right here. Abram, who was childless, was reminded that his descendants would be like the dust of the earth in number. He was already an old man. He was already an old man in this place. It, it's not in his youth that all this is happening. He was already an old man. And God is still reminding him of a promise that his descendants were going to be greater than the dust of the earth. Abraham, Abram responded too. In verse 18 it says, Abram moved his tents and went. He didn't just sit around and sulk because Lot took the best. He moved on and he went and, 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 and walked in God's promises and set up his tents right where he was supposed to be. But what was his final response? Let's look at the end of verse 18. He built an altar there to the Lord. He built an altar to the Lord. So, so while he could have, again, just been sunken, he went and worshiped. When things don't go the way that you necessarily want, what do you do? How do you respond? I normally get mad. I'll tell you, this evening, I, I needed to go back over everything. I had a pounding headache. You know, I, I may not act like I don't feel good, but, man, I didn't feel good this afternoon. I didn't feel good when we were eating today. But, but you know what? When I don't feel good, what else happens? The kids go crazy. It's just madness and pandemonium at the house. And I need to make sure I had all my notes together for this. I wanted, I've sulked. I got aggravated. It happens. Crystal got aggravated with me too. It's just, it's just what happens. That's what we do. We get caught up in our feelings. But you know what I did? I stopped and I prayed. I stopped and I prayed. It's an amazing thing. It'll change your entire direction. Spend a little time with the Lord and see what he gives you. Abram was able to stay and walk in his promises, and he was able to keep a cool head and be satisfied in what he had because he chose to worship the Lord. So what's the difference here? While Lot entered his land based on what he saw, Abram entered, entered his land by faith and worshiped the Lord at the altar. So what's the difference between Abram and Lot aside from living in God's promises and not? There isn't one. One trusted God in faith and one didn't. That's it. And so when we look across the room and we think about our own conditions, we need to reflect on that. Are you walking in faith or are you walking in feelings? Because if you're walking in faith, things are not going to get to you the same way. You're going to be able to trust in God and when things are not right or when you don't enjoy your circumstances, you can still trust Him. He's going to guide you right through where you need to go. But when you live by feelings or when you live by sight, Man, is it almost impossible to walk through this life. It is so hard. It seems like everything just piles up on you. It gets heavier and heavier and heavier, and you just can't get away from it. This world is a hard place. It is hard. I, I actually had five minutes to turn on the news while ago, and I see that we're shooting down things flying all over the U.S. right now. I ain't watched the news in two months. I ain't had time for it. I really didn't have time for it today because now I'm consumed in it. I even got on the flight tracker radar, and I saw well, we've got Air Force bombers flying all across the, the, the U.S.-Canadian border this evening. They've been up there for like eight hours. You know, we, this world is a hard place. If you get to thinking about it, it'll make you worry. But you know what? We don't have to worry. We don't have to. Abram didn't worry about where he was going or what he was going to do. He trusted in the Lord, and you can do the same. And so Hebrews 11, 8, I think it just absolutely brings all this together. It truly expresses the character of Abram like no other. And here he's called Abraham. But it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Hmm. How many times can you go out not knowing where you're going and be comfortable and be confident? I ain't too good at that. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I'm not too good at it. But by faith, we can do that. I, and I, and I, I don't like to be so redundant, but it's just like when God called me here. He took me way out of my element. He did something that I never could have truly expected. or I wasn't expecting it. 
But he did it. He did it, and I was able to do it in faith. And man, has he blessed me. I hope y'all are being blessed like I am. That's, I really do. But I have been so blessed by stepping out on faith and being able to just walk in his ways. And so we see very clearly one trusted, believed, and was filled with faith, and the other was just, con just constantly in flux with the things of this world. And so when we get to chapter 14, it paints a more in-depth picture picture of the things that we're dealing with it shows us that abram is not only the picture of jesus remember we're still looking for jesus through these details in, the, in this old testament story but we also it shows us how much we are so much like good old lot how our flesh is so much like him so this intense battle takes place over sodom and gomorrah there's this really big war that happens in chapter 14 and in it you've got four kings and all of their men going against five kings and all of their men. And this battle, as it happens, we find that the five kings get defeated by the four. And, that, and in the, inside those five kings is the Sodom and Gomorrah company. And they get defeated and they take off. But as they take off, the four kings come in and they take captives. And inside those captives, some of those... I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I'm going to read this for us. Look in chapter 14 in verses 11 and 12. It says, Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions, and they went their way. But here's the key. They also took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. I almost completely want to just tell you the story without reading it. I had it right here in my notes. But we find that Lot was taken along with all of his goods, his family, and everything that they had. He was taken by these kings, taken captive. And so it's really important to understand Lot was taken captive. Why is that so important? Because I want to ask you a question based on that. When was Lot truly taken captive? Was he taken captive right here in this moment, or was he taken captive when he cast his eyes to Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place? I'm going to tell you this. He was taken captive when he made the choice to go where he went, not when these men took him. We always look at this. We always see the finale of everything. That's where we always look. Man, that guy ended up in prison. I just can't believe it. You know, he made those choices. No, no, no. He ended up in prison when he did something the first time. He didn't get... There's a series of things that led him to prison, but he was taken captive when he made his very first decision to get on drugs or when he made his very first decision to take something that didn't belong to him. You don't go to prison with your first mistake, I promise you. But with this, with Lot... He didn't get taken captive when, when, when these kings came in. He was taken captive by the things, by his heart that was given to the things of the world and his heart not being given to the Lord. When we walk by faith, we're going to be taken captive, but we're going to be taken captive by the Lord. You'll be doing things that you can't imagine on the other side of it. But when you're taken captive by this world, you'll end up doing things that you can't imagine too. But they're going to be grave and costly. And eventually, they're going to end up in a place like this where we're taken captive by some other force outside of our power. And so after the war, or when the Sinai... So I'm getting ahead of myself. So we usually do not realize the effects of our choices until the wheels truly fall off. Usually, they fall off long before we ever recognize it. And so we talked about Saul this morning. He had been blind all of his life, but he did not realize it until he met Jesus. It's the same thing for us. When we, we, we're blind, we are completely blind until the moment Jesus reveals himself to us and that we surrender to him as Lord and Savior. We don't realize our need for him. I promise you, if everybody truly understood, understood how much they really needed him and how much he provided, they'd be willing to surrender to him immediately. But we just don't get it. We don't understand it. I, well, my goodness, I would give anything to go back and to have done it when I was five years old. To, have been, to not have had to go through the things that I did as, as a teenager, as an adult, the, the things that I raised kids under because of my lostness. But I can't change that. The wheels were off. I just didn't know it. But eventually God revealed himself and that changed it all for me. So Lot was taken captive at the moment he chose to settle in Las Vegas. I'm just going to say it. He chose Las Vegas, the sin city, and he was taken captive right then. So either way, while all of this is going on, one of Lot's men escaped. And so if we look at verses 13 through 16, we see the, then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eskel and brother of Aner. And they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah. 
which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. So here we find the rescue for Lot. And so I told you, if we keep looking, we're going to find Jesus. We can go all the way back to the beginning, and we can see that, Lot, that Abram was, was a man of promise. And we can see Jesus there. We can see that he was sent to save the people, or that the, the Savior was going to come through him. It's, again, we have all kinds of types of Jesus in it. But right here, we see him again where he is being sent by God to go and rescue Lot. He's a rescuer, just as Jesus is our rescue. But by the way, did you notice while he was the only suitable man for the job, did you notice what type of army he took? I told you earlier that this first battle was an intense battle with five armies versus four. And the four armies won. The four kings won. But now, bear in mind that these four kings were band still banded together. And Abram is going and pursuing them with 318 men. That's it. 318 men. And he's going to go chase down four armies to go rescue Lot. You see the difference in that? That's a man walking in faith. That's not a man trusting in what he has or what he can do. It's a man that is certain that God's going to provide the way. 318 men go, and he splits them. He didn't just take 318 and go. He split the two forces. So he had 189 and 189, and they go out, and they go, oh, that number's way off. Excuse me. It's 159 and 159. I can do quick math, but I just split that up really bad. But he had 159 and 159, and he goes and takes back what was rightfully the people's. So Abram took victory because he was living in God's promises, not because they were mighty and strong. They were mighty and strong in the Lord, but not in themselves. Not in mighty and strong in number, but mighty and strong in the Lord. Jesus takes victory because he is God in the flesh. And that is the only way. And that is the only way that we find victory in this situation. So this is where we find Jesus. Lot was taken without hope. He was taken in without hope, but the Lord provided through Abram. Just like we are taken in without hope, God provided for us through Jesus. God continues to provide for everyone, for everyone through Jesus. If it wasn't for him, we have nothing. But this is not the end of the story for Lot. One rescue wasn't enough. We're going to need more. So while there's an entire message in each one of these passages, I kind of want to just fast forward all the way to Genesis 17. And we're going to find there that the Lord visits Abram again. God was constantly visiting Abram and talking to him and sharing with him. But during this meeting, verse 5 tells us that the Lord changes his name from Abram to Abraham. That takes the pressure off me. It's like this morning trying to differentiate Saul and Paul. Abraham and Abram, I struggle with it. I know, I understand but, but and, and God's making his promise here. He's reiterating his promise, and that's when he changes his name. But, um, so Abraham is who we're going to be talking about from here on out. But Genesis 18, though, it tells us about three men that come and visit Abraham. And we find that one of them is the Lord. And so while we can continue to find Jesus in the details when we look at Abraham, let me tell you what, one of these was the Lord who came in the flesh. This means that we get a pre-type of Jesus right here in front of Abraham. Remember, no man has ever seen God. If any man sees God, they're dead. And Abraham continued to live from here. But he stood in front of him. So this has to be Jesus that came and visited along with two angels. So we can assume that the Lord is there. And we've got that. So in, they were on a mission. Their mission was to come and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They first wanted to talk to Abraham about the promise of a, of a child. But the second thing that they wanted to talk about is they were heading to Sodom and Gomorrah to go wipe it off the face of this earth because of all the wicked things that were ha happening there. And so we find, though, that Abraham was ready to intercede on Sodom's behalf. If we look at Genesis 18, 22, it says, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. They were getting ready to go destroy this place, but Abram, Abraham stood before the Lord. Will you or can you stand in the gap for somebody? We talk about that all the time. I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to fill the gap. But can you? Are you willing, are you capable of standing in the gap for someone? There was a great divide between God and Sodom right now. The things that were happening there are things I'm not even going to talk about in this church service tonight. But filthy, filthy, filthy things were happening. But still, Abraham was willing to stand in the gap for them. Praise God, there was someone willing to stand in the gap for me and for you. And that was Jesus. I'm just as wicked, I'm just as vile, just as every one of us are, but Jesus stood in that gap. Can you stand in the gap for someone? Is your life reflective of some way that you can do that? So how far was, was Abraham willing to go for Lot? 
He was willing to literally stand before God for him. That says a lot about his character. That says a lot about his faith. And it says a lot about his person and love. And so if we look in Genesis 18, 23 through 33, and I'm not going to read all those, it shows Abraham is truly pleading with the Lord not to destroy the people. He's begging and pleading. He starts with 50 and 20 and 10 and 5. If there's just that many righteous people, will you please just not destroy it? And God says, sure, if they are, I won't destroy it. But God knew the hearts of the people before he ever even went. He knew what the end result was going to be. And so if we look, Abraham was not willing to see just one parish. He wanted, to, he wanted to save that entire generation. If you think about that, though, think about this. John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus didn't want to see anybody perish either. He was willing to stand in the gap for us. Will you intercede for someone? Can you intercede for someone? Praise God for those that have. And so all the while Abraham is interceding, look at what has come of Lot and his living conditions. Genesis 19 tells us of God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a lot of information there, but I don't believe that we want to stay all night. I'm just going to say that up front. It would take me forever to get through that too. But, but what we can see... What we can see is if we look at the conclusion of Genesis 19, this is where Lot's legacy is made complete. And this is where so many men's legacies are left, okay? Verses 30 through 38, we're going to read that in, in chapter 19. It says, Then Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains, and his two da daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zor. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our, old, our father is old. And there is no man on earth to come in to, to us as is custom of all the earth, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him. And when that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were the child were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day, and the younger she bore also bore a son and called his name Ben Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. So when we read that story, goodness gracious, there's a lot there, and I'm not going to try to, to unpack all of it. But it truly speaks to the character of Lot. And it speaks to the character that he passed on to his next generation. That's what we need to be concerned about. You, you and your decisions do not just affect you. They affect those around you. Your character affects those around you. And it's clearly seen here. We had Abraham that was full of faith. And don't get me wrong, they're going to make plenty of mistakes. His lineage is going to make all kinds of Abraham made plenty of mistakes. He didn't trust in the Lord when he went into Egypt. He tried to tell, have his wife tell him that, that it was his sister. I mean, he made plenty, plenty, plenty of mistakes. But Lot's mistakes were carried on to his children to the point that they were the mother's of these two nations, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And if you're not familiar with them, they were thorns in the side of Israel forever. Forever. They are the, they, these are the pagan people of that world that they were constantly in battle with. And it all started right here because of a lack of faith. If, if Lot would have been willing to turn his faith back to the Lord... All of this could have been corrected. But instead, he, packed his, he, he, he passed his faithless character on to his children. And so we will leave a legacy based on the choices that we make. Every one of us will. We're all going to leave a legacy based on our choices. Lot left a legacy for sure. But here's the thing. Even in this, God called him a righteous man. If, if you, if, I'm not going to try to make you flip here because I'm going to read it fast. But 2 Peter 2, 6-8 it says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, 
who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the world, for the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. While he was righteous, his actions and his descendants revealed his ways. I don't necessarily completely understand that fully because I know that he would have been probably the most miserable man you've ever met in your life because if you're righteous and you live in the conditions he did, you cannot be satisfied by no means. It's never going to happen. And he didn't want to leave it is the bad thing. He had to be drugged out of there by an angel. And so while he was righteous, his actions and his descendants revealed his true ways. All of us are leaving a legacy in everything that we do. Abraham's going to leave a legacy that leads to us, that leads to our salvation, that leads to the salvation of the entire world. Lot left a legacy that was the thorn in the side to that generation, to all of that generation. So he chose to rely on himself and his eyes, and this was the result. So we must make a decision within the context of their lives. Are we going to live by faith as Abraham, or are we going to live by feelings as Lot? Lot was given as many avenues of escape as he could possibly need because God provided a rescue time and time and time again through Abraham. He gave him everything he needed. He was his Jesus as Jesus is to us. He gave him every opportunity through him. But while he did, Abraham was, given those, Abraham was also given opportunity, and he chose God in faithfulness through it all. One showed the power of the Lord within himself, and the other did not. Abraham built altars and worshipped, and Lot walked in the ways of the immoral. So where are you, and how will you respond to that tonight? Are you going to continue in those ways, or are you going to turn and trust the Lord in his ways? Do you live a life of faith or do you live a life that is trusting in your own abilities? Are you trusting in what you can see? I think that God gave us all this so that we could learn that we can truly trust in him in everything that we do. Everything. We don't have to just, we don't have to trust in him in some things or just trust him in our salvation. Uh, Lot, Lot knew God. Lot knew him well. Lot prospered because of God. But Lot did not have the faith of Abraham. There's nothing preventing you from having that tonight. There's nothing preventing you from having that tonight except for your own choice. And so as we conclude tonight, I want you to reflect on that. Do you trust in the Lord for everything? Or do you trust in your own power and your ability? I think that's the best question that we all need to answer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for faithfulness. Thank you for the example that Abraham provided. And God, thank you for giving him to us as as a means to salvation through, through his bloodline, through Jesus. Father, thank you for your bloodline through Jesus. If it wasn't for that, we would still have no hope. So, Father, I pray tonight as we look into our own lives and we take a moment to reflect, God, I pray that you reveal our real hearts to us. God, we're going to leave a legacy one way or another. And I know that a lot of people don't get really motivated about who they are. They're not really that concerned. But when you talk about their children or their grandchildren, Lord, it stirs them. And so, Father, we need to understand that we are leaving the legacy that's going to guide our children, our grandchildren, and the, 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 the generations to come. We're guiding them with the decisions that we're making today. So, Lord, I pray as, as you work through this church service, Lord, I pray as you touch every heart that you reveal who we really are in you right now. Lord, I pray that we can all see the far-reaching effects of our decisions. And, Lord, I pray that we can be right with you that we can have all of our faith in you and that we can trust in you for everything. So, Lord, if there's someone that doesn't know you tonight, Lord, I pray that you reveal that to them. I pray that they're willing to surrender and, Lord, that they can walk in your promises and have faith in all things. Lord, if there's someone that needs to get right, that they've not walked in faith, Lord, they have the opportunity to repent and turn from that tonight and to walk and trust in you in everything. So, Lord, have your way in this room. Lord, touch us and give us the direction that you desire. Father, I thank you. I can't wait to see what you're going to do through it all. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'll stand, we'll have a moment of invitation. The altar is completely open. There's a lot of things that we can be praying about. I have people on my heart. I have people on my mind. And yes. But I just want you to say, I just want you to know, if you need Jesus, please come and grab him by the hand. I'd love to lead, him, lead you to him tonight.